In 1503, Leonardo da Vinci was commissioned by the government of Florence to paint the wall of the Florentine Council Hall, the Palazzo Vecchio. The contract signed by important figures like Gonfaloniere Piero Soderini and philosopher Niccolo Machiavelli. It should have been his greatest and most ambitious work of his lifetime. The Florentine Republic saw the Battle of Anghiari as worthy of commemoration, it being a victory over Niccolo Piccinino, the mercenary commander of Milan. The Battle of Anghiari was to have been opposite to another glorious painting, the Battle of Cassina. The plan was that these two frescoes should be painted simultaneously by the up-and-coming 27-year-old Michelangelo Buonarroti and the established master Leonardo di Serpiero da Vinci. The two artists were developing a strong rivalry. They had formed a severe dislike for each other and Leonardo seemed to consider painting alongside Michelangelo as a personal challenge. Michelangelo, for his part, called Leonardo the liar player from Milan. It has been established that Leonardo did start out an education of professional musician, specifically as liar player, before he entered the workshop of Verrocchio. This was destined to be the battle of the titans. Many famous artists came in sometimes to view the progress or rather set the spectacle, like a young Raphael who was about 21 year old at the time, and famous painter and architect Giorgio Vasari. The actual Battle of Anghiari took place in 1440 on the afternoon of the 29th of June. The numerically superior Milanese launched a surprise attack along the San Salpocro Anghiari axis. The Florentines recognized the dust that had been stirred up and immediately prepared for the defense, which began at the bridge over a nearby canal. By a counterattack on the Milanese flank, they soon were forced to retreat at midnight. The painting itself depicts in the center of his scene four men riding, raging war, horses engaged in a battle for the possession of the standard. Giorgio Vasari noted in his book, lives of the most excellent painters, sculptors and architects, it would be impossible to express the inventiveness of Leonardo's design for the soldiers' uniforms which he sketched in all their variety, were the crests of the helmets and other ornaments, not to mention the incredible skill he demonstrated in the shape and features of the horses, which Leonardo better than any other master created with their boldness, muscles and beauty. Unfortunately, only preliminary sketches or copies of his sketches remain of the painting which would have been da Vinci's largest and most ambitious work. As he always experimented with his technique, Leonardo used the unsuited type of plaster. The work he had barely begun was irreparably ruined. Problems started as soon as Leonardo placed his brush to the wall. The paste didn't harden and was supposed to hold a full-scale drawing of the future fresco, the so-called cartoon. As Leonardo lifted his hand to start work, the cartoon slid to the floor 
and tore apart. The encaustic technique should have supplied a suitable base for the application of oils. An ingenious scaffolding was used to raise Leonardo to the needed height for finishing the upper portion of the work. But though the scaffolding was a brilliant design, the painting methods chosen were absolutely disastrous. Making matters worse, he afterwards tried to dry the fresco with fire. It is very likely that Leonardo didn't even finish the full fresco. Contrary to popular belief, Leonardo da Vinci struggled throughout his entire career with the craft of painting. There remain only 16 paintings which are undoubtedly and solely the work of Leonardo da Vinci and three of those works are unfinished. The rest are manuscripts and drawings. Of course many other works are attributed to him all the time but obviously lack the necessary skill. But these works are financially beneficiary as even a rumored Leonardo is bringing in a huge amount of money. Yet again he struggled with the task of finishing a fresco. He had already bad experience with another painting since the Last Supper which he finished only five years prior already started to fall apart. His contract with the Florentine government specifically stated that in 1505 the overall design and the cartoon of the Anghiari artwork has to be finished and thus he already should have begun to colorize the fresco where in fact he was struggling with the sketches. In November the 1st in 1503 a new pope was elected, Julius II, who immediately ordered Michelangelo to return to the Vatican and begin to work on his tomb. Far overranking the Palazzo Vecchio, Michelangelo left Florence leaving the Battle of Cascina also unfinished, ending the competition between the two rivals on a disappointing note. The closest we can get to the original is the engraving from Lorenzo Zacchia. He probably saw the original in the Palazzo Vecchio and made his own version 50 years later. Around 1603 Rubens also produced a copy of Leonardo's Battle of Anghiari, based on the engraving done by Lorenzo Zacchia. Its design has many variations to the original, including the heads of all the warriors, their weapons and their armor. Yet Rubens achieved something in his painting that no other artist has managed to portray, that is Leonardo's sense of power, confused fury and intense violence. Rubens' fine line work is almost as delicate and detailed as Leonardo's itself. Rubens' Battle of the Standards is sometimes incorrectly portrayed in books or on the internet as being the original done by Leonardo, which it most definitely is not. One other often overlooked copy from the Battle of Anghiari is the Vakulai version which is allegedly copied directly from the fresco itself, though unproven if it is actually contemporary with the original work, it has great importance. And there are several indications to this. When this drawing was done some parts of Leonardo's mural were unfinished. This can clearly be seen in the sketch, where the artist remained faithful to the original work by also leaving his drawing incomplete. Unfortunately the unknown artist was not familiar with Leonardo's presentation so he translated the wall painting in his own style, losing the fiery intense display from the master. Rubens later recaptured the style but sacrificed the accuracy. As late as 1968 another unfinished version appeared as a true copy from the Battle of Anghiari, this time by Raffaello from whom we know used to enter the palazzo during the preparations of Leonardo. From this alleged eyewitness copy another version was made, the Tavola Doria. It is worth mentioning that these two versions differ in their details. For example the weapon held by the right side soldier in the Zakia version is a battle axe, not a sword. 
and there is even a version from Salvador Dali, jokingly entitled Copy of a Rubens Copied from a Leonardo. But one of my favorite versions is the Wolf Foster from 1982. The extreme contortion of the warrior and the obstructed view of the horse's head gives the impression of a centaur. A centaur is a wild, fabulous creature of Greek mythology, having the upper body of a man and the lower body of a horse. Centaurs were regarded as being coarse and irrational, and were usually interpreted as a symbol of the animalistic side of humans. The main focus point of the picture are the scared eyes of the horse on the right side, but both of their bodies are important elements for the general direction of the energy and of the dynamics. The head of the horse on the right side would fit perfectly on the body of the headless horse, but would make a repetitive composition. Therefore, I venture myself to the assumption that the headless horse was a deliberate, conscious compositional decision by Leonardo. Having so many different versions, we can compare the similarities and differences. The early versions differ greatly in their choice of weapons, ranging from battle axe to spear and sword. After Rubens introduced the crossing sword, every subsequent version adopted this feature, as it ties the chaotic composition nicely up into a knot. And I think it is safe to assume that animals and animal heads were supposed to have a big role in the Da Vinci version. Their armor should represent a swarm of flailing, beating beasts. Vasari pointed out in his book the intricateness of the soldier's armor and maybe we can get a more accurate image of the warriors when we look at the drawing done by Leonardo profile of a warrior in helmet. Here we can see the animal flourishes on the armor. The drawing is unrelated, but gives us a good idea how it could have been. The standard education of artists consists of copying classical works of art to put themselves in the mindset of great masters. Many museums still dedicate an entire day for artists who wish to copy the works hanging in the galleries. Thousands have done so, including great classical painters from Turner to Ingres, Impressionists from Monet to Degas, and modernists like Chagall and Giacometti. You have to copy and recopy the masters, Degas insisted, and it's only after having proved oneself as a good copyist that you can reasonably try to do a still life of a reddish. It was finally Vasari who completed the decorations in the council hall. The decoration of the hall involved considerable work, which Vasari completed in two phases. On the walls, Vasari painted six battle scenes, representing the military successes of Cosimo I. He also decorated the studio of Francesco I in the Manurist style of his time. Vasari enjoyed high reputation during his lifetime and amassed considerable fortune. In 1547, he built himself a fine house in Arezzo, now a museum honoring him. He was elected to the municipal council, or priori, of his native town and finally rose to the supreme officer of Confaloniere. In 1563, he helped found the Florence Academia e Compagnia della Arte del Disegno, with the Grand Duke and Michelangelo Escapi of the institution and 36 artists chosen as members. To top it all off, he was the first art historian. Many art historians and critics believe that the lost Leonardo is still hidden beneath the Giorgio Vasari. It is safe to assume Vasari did not paint over an artist's work whom he so much admired, and Vasari himself hid a secret message to the fresco which allegedly covers up the Battle of Anghiari.
It was in the late 60s when Italian art historian and Da Vinci expert Carlo Pedretti proposed the theory. Maybe the Battle of Anghiari was still intact and still in the whole of the 500, only covered up. Indeed, at least in three other cases, rather than destroying the existing artwork, Vasari protected existing frescoes by building a new wall, just an inch in front of the ones. He likely made no secret what he was doing, but he apparently made no record of it either. And over the centuries, all knowledge of these inner walls and the artworks still hidden was forgotten. Maurizio Zeracini is a diagnostician of Italian art. A graduate in bioengineering from the University of California, he became obsessed with the idea to recover the lost Da Vinci. He therefore founded in 77 the first company in Italy for diagnostic and non-destructive analysis of art and architecture. And finally, in 2011, Seracini decided to use minimally invasive techniques to investigate the Palazzo Vecchio. Seracini wanted permission to drill 14 holes. In the end, he only drilled 6. But only one hole produced any evidence at all, but the evidence was compelling nonetheless. Tiny samples of paint taken from the inner wall showed evidence of two pigments, one brown and one black. Similar pigments used by Leonardo to paint the Mona Lisa and the painting of Saint John the Baptist. The sample of black pigment was found to contain the same proportions of iron and manganese oxide. Drilling holes into a Vasari was highly controversial. Petitions were launched and it became a political debate. After all, it was a cultural heritage and drawing in tourists from all around the world. The story of the Battle of Anghiari ends here, at least at the time of the making of this video. Having brought your attention to the huge efforts of all these artists and scientists and their huge efforts to preserve every single particle of pigment to the coming generations, I will now shift the style and the subject matter of this video in an incongruous manner. Let me introduce you to these two brutes, the Chapman brothers. These barely educated millionaires and alleged pedophiles were investigated by Russian prosecutors for fascism and regularly threatened to kill reporters who are investigating or reporting negatively about them. Like spoiled rats screeching artistically for attention, they somehow managed to obtain one of the few remaining sets of the disasters of war prints, produced directly from Goya's original plates in 1937. In 2003, they scribbled clownish faces over original Goya prints. Amazingly, these galleries and some few hacks consider this act of barbarism to be art in itself. True to the motto, barbarism for the sake of barbarism. I ask myself if these artists or those who support them will find it also amusing when their own cherished installations will be discarded. We decided to draw on Goya. We got someone from the gallery to go and buy them for us. We suggested that we were going to have a, a slush fund so that the money that was uh, hopefully recuperated by selling the first work would go into buying the second set. 
so that again we would turn it from a, a, a kind of a, a conceptual or gestural act into something which was much more malevolent. Which is, to, which is to say that if we get our hands on every Goya set, we will draw on them. The idea of, of drawing on the work was a way of um, amplifying some of the more monstrous or uh, uh, abject elements of the work, which kind of you know, maybe perhaps tease them out. I mean, the, the point about Goya making the disaster of war was that it was about wide dissemination. You know, the etching press was about kind of uh, uh, distribution rather than kind of scarcity. But what we're doing is we're rarifying the work by drawing on them, so that in, a, in effect what we can do is that we can deplete the numbers that are available so that perhaps they do become, you know, rarer than rocking horse shit. <laughs> to be very clear, this is an act of vandalism. Because some no-name uh, twats destroying the prints of Francesco Goya is vandalism, nothing else. Even if you don't like the art of Goya, he nevertheless was an important artist of the Enlightenment. His work protested the violence of the Inquisition and the horrors of war, yet some newly rich vulgarians and decadent nihilists still think it is a cool and edgy to eradicate and dismantle culture and history. They don't understand that the art, true art, has to inspire others. It should elevate the people to aim higher. Or maybe just to copy it in uh, some museum. However, this is not a philosophical question as many dilettantes, quacks and wannabe art journalists would like to frame the problem. These prints were visual documentation of the violence in the Peninsulan War and world famous for their dissent against the war in general. They robbed future generations the opportunity to witness these works in person. But I suppose there are two kinds of people in the world. And as famous art critic Robert Hughes said, Goya will obviously survive these twerps whose names will be forgotten in a few years from now.